This is fantastic. Seattle, it's great to be here. Are you guys ready for uh, some superstar tonight? <laughs> My name is Frank Munoz. I'm the National Tour Promoter. Uh, we've been doing about a hundred of these things with Ted Neely since 2013. Um, and why are we? And, and by the way, I'm not in the movie. I was two years old when this thing came out, so I'm not Caiaphas. Um, we did this because Universal Pictures uh, remastered this film in 2013 for the 40th anniversary of the film. So um, we started doing this, and Ted, we had a private screening at the uh, Chinese Theater in Hollywood. And it was amazing. So for everybody here who has seen the film and has the DVD and the VHS and has seen it on television, you've never seen it like this before. The sound is remastered uh, and the picture looks like it was filmed a year ago. So you are in for a big treat. Um, Ted will be here afterwards signing stuff. We have a bunch of goodies up in the lobby. So definitely hang out. And without uh, any further ado, I'm gonna introduce my uh, touring partner. Uh, I call him the king of rock opera. Let's go down the list. He was in Hair. He was in the Who's Tommy. He was in Sgt. Pepper's, the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper's on Broadway. Uh, you just see, he was in a film, a brand new rock opera called The Devil's, the Devil's Carnival 2 that just came out last year. And uh, you might have seen him on the big screen getting his head blown off in Quentin Tarantino's Django Unchained a few years ago. So, but you know him and you love him as JC. Please put your hands together, Seattle, nice and loud. Here comes Mr. Ted Neely. still doing these wonderful experiences because of you guys. My goodness, it's incredible. It's, it's been a few summers since you've been in Seattle, right? Yes, it's been a few, yes, yes. But I've been here with the show live more than once as well. Uh, and it's incredible to be able to be connected with something that's this beautiful. I, uh, I'm amazed, still. I'm possibly the biggest fan of this thing myself. <laughs> Seriously, because uh, I, we had no idea when we were making this thing it was ever even going to be released, much less still be remembered this many years later. What is it, five years now since the film was out? <laughs> Sit in my living room, Ted. Let's chat. <laughs> Sounds good to me. You guys met Frank and know what Frank's doing here, right? And, and listen, I'm a fan too. I, I, got the, I, I stole the soundtrack from my sister in, uh, when I was five. And uh, it was my first taste of rock and roll. By the way, this is a, this is, I tell everybody this. Uh, this is my favorite musical, people say, okay? It's not a musical. Hello, Dolly is a musical. Uh, you know, all the, you know, singing in the rain and all that stuff. This is a rock opera. It's rock and roll. So that's, that was what got me into rock and roll. I've been lucky enough to be in the business now for 25 years, turn around the country with a, a few bands you may have heard of. And, um, yeah, I love doing this. This is great. It's great to, uh, to meet other fans and uh, talk about this film. He says uh, bands you might have heard of. Uh, tell us the name of the band you've been working with. They've never heard of or... the bands I work with. Well, but there's one one band that's it's sort of currently extinct. nobody here knows who Metallica is. <laughs> Imagine that spending 20 years with Metallica. So uh, enough about me, Ted. Let's talk about the film. <laughs> Uh, we always do this at all of our screenings. Like I said, we've done about 120 of these now. This is our first time in Seattle and in the Pacific Northwest. We're going to be doing that. We're going to be up in Bellingham tomorrow, and then we're going to be uh, rolling around Oregon uh, over the weekend in Eugene, Sisters, and um, Portland. So if you know anybody uh, in those areas and you like what you saw tonight, please uh, let them know to come on out. But we always want to know, we want to meet the audience before we start talking. So. Uh, show of hands, how many people here tonight have seen this film, Jesus Christ Superstar? Okay, how many people here tonight have never seen this film, Jesus Christ Superstar? We always get movies at every screen. So let's talk a little bit about the film, Ted. Uh, it's a universal picture, like I was telling them that they, you know, Universal did the remaster that we're going to see, the DCP, as, yeah. it's, as it's, they say in the business. Um, this wasn't filmed 
at Universal Studios. You guys didn't no. do the, you didn't do the crucifixion like next to the Psycho House or or the, tell everybody. No, but we did get Psycho near the crucifixion. There you go. <laughs> nice one. Um, tell them where the film was shot entirely. Anybody know? Israel. Think about that. Uh, think about going to that country at all. I don't know if any of you been to Israel? Quite an experience, just knowing the history and what went on over there and still goes on every day. Uh, but we shot all of it in Israel. Norman Jewison, our brilliant director, uh, was there for six months prior to our arrival, just scouting locations and making sure he found as many historical places as possible for us to do what we were doing. So the whole thing was absolutely a magnificent experience. And as I said earlier, we had no idea when we were making the film it would ever be released, much less be remembered this long afterwards. And to see the kind of an influence that it has had on you folks, wow, it's just amazing to be a part of it. It's absolutely amazing. So we had a great time all the way through, and Frank knows this film better than anybody, so go. Well, I mean, when you guys arrived, uh, and, and by the way, there's a, there's a, we're laughing about this in the car right here, there's a rumor going around that the beginning of the film, the tour bus, or the bus that comes into, the, the, it brings all the players in, that was your rock and roll tour bus, correct? <laughs> You did say rumor, didn't you? Yeah, it's a rumor. No, here's the, here's the real story. You know, on the commentary that's on the DVD and Blu-ray, uh, where Ted and Norman Jewison are talking about the beginning of the film and talk, comment, commenting on the film as it goes by, you're just kind of like, it was a good joke, right? Yes, yes. Well, think about it, if you will, please. Um, yes, we did tour a lot as a band. Nobody knew us then, nor remembers us now. But we worked a lot. That's what I did before I got into any of these other projects. And uh, we, Norman and I were sitting and watching the film when we did the talk back. And uh, we were joking constantly about various things that happened on set. And Norman is a wonderful human being, so the jokes were flying. And uh, the bus happened, and, and I just passed to Norman and said, well, you know, man, it was great of you to use my rock and roll bus for this movie. And he said, yeah, and he moved right on, as if it was the truth, you see. Well, it wasn't, and you think about it, what would we have to do to get that school bus from, from Texas to Israel? Would it what? cost as much as a movie? <laughs> More. <laughs> so, so that bus was a Jitney bus. bus. That's right. The yeah. buses that are used in Israel for tours, they take people all over the place. They don't, I mean, there are nicer ones than that one, uh, but that's also, when you say Jitney, that's the buses that pick up people and drop them off anywhere they want to be. Uh, and we were happy that he was able to find that funky old bus so we could do that. Because the whole idea from Norman, because Norman Jewison not only was the director and the innovator to make a film, he also wrote the screenplay for this based upon the music. So every element of concept that's in this piece, Norman thought that up. And he wanted to have a bus that looked like that because his concept was that we were a group of traveling singers and musicians and ne'er-do-wells who were doing the show live in Israel and he didn't want anybody to think we were pretending to be the, the people that we play. We were actors, singers, dancers, musicians doing the show. That's why we arrived in the bus and most of us left on the bus. Does anybody know who didn't leave on the bus? <laughs> you know, no, ser seriously, the, the, I, we, I, like I said, we've done so many of these things and, and my theory about the, the longevity of this film and of Ted as this legendary character that he, that he portrayed was the screenplay that Norman Jewison created for this because the way that this movie ends is not how you guys did it on Broadway um, and it has that Rod Serling Twilight Zone ending where one of the cast does not get on the bus and at the last scene that we see is the crucifixion or the cross uh, and Obviously, that's the, the little tidbit that Norman left in there, kind of hinting at you staying in the desert. Well, the truth of the matter was I couldn't afford a round-trip ticket on that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, honestly, uh, Norman, again, wanted to use the bus with us arriving and with most of us leaving, 
And the reason that he chose not to have my character get back on the bus was to suggest resurrection of the spirit. Because, uh, as you know, Superstar stops with the crucifixion. That's as far as it goes. That's as far as Tim and Andrew wanted to take the story. Because their concept was they were dealing with the last seven days in the life of the man called Jesus of Nazareth as seen through the eyes of his contemporaries, his friends, his foes, whomever. And you stop with death. Uh, we took issue, he and I, with that. Both of us felt that some semblance of resurrection should be in the film. We're talking visuals here. But Tim and Andrew were steadfast in their concept and they wanted to stop dealing there with life. Uh, so Norman wanted to have some essence to suggest resurrection and he felt the idea of having the entire cast get back on the bus except for the person who pretended to be Jesus, that that would suggest at least spiritual resurrection. And you see everybody getting on the bus, and as they got to the bus and stepped up on the steps entering the doorway, they all looked off in the same direction, and then he cut to the crucifixion. So Norman did everything he could to make that happen. And poor Carl, bless his heart, he was the last person to get on the bus, and he gets up there and secures his position, and he's holding it, and he's looking. And then the guy that was driving the bus took off. And Carl nearly <laughs> fell off the bus. <laughs> Which, and uh, and it, I don't know if you can feel it, but Carl is here in spirit today. Carl, forgive me if that sounds strange, but Carl is always here in spirit. Let's hear it for Carl Anderson. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, uh, Carl passed away in 2004. Uh, he was battling leukemia. And um, we dedicate all of our screenings to the memory of Carl. And um, what we want to do, we did a, and we'll, we'll talk about this, shameless plugs up here, but we, we did a reunion of the entire cast, except for Carl, with Norman Jewison in New York last year. And I asked Norman, now at the end of, for everybody who's seen this movie, at the end of the film, when the credits roll, you know, it's dead silence. There's no ending music, you know, nothing like that. I asked Norman, would it be okay that when we do these screenings, we, have, we give Carl the last word? So what we do, and you guys can obviously stay in your seats for the credits roll, we play a bootleg tape of Carl singing Superstar from Philadelphia 1997, which turned out to be the very final performance that Carl and Ted did together on stage. Is that correct? In yes. Philadelphia? Yes, it is. So um, we play that during the credits. So uh, definitely enjoy it, and we always give Carl Anderson the last word at all these things. So um, let's talk a little bit about Carl. Uh, one of my favorite moments, I think this film is way ahead of its time, uh, the way it was directed, the way it was put together. My favorite sequence of the film is when Carl sings, I don't know how to love him at the end, and then he goes into Judas's death, and that whole sequence of him running through the desert I mean, again, way ahead of its time, filmed in 1972, and it has, you know, now, nowadays, every film, you need a barf bag when you come into the movie theater, everything is all, you know, the camera's all shaking, you're moving it around. They, Norman did that in 1972, you see all that, and, and it was a, it was a, was it a grip? Who was the guy holding the camera? Some big British guy, right, who was like running with Carl, doing all that point of view stuff. And one of my favorite transitions from one scene to the next, is when, after Carl hangs himself, after Judas hangs himself, and you see that pullback from, how many yards was that? I mean, that's from one mountain to, it was well over two football fields in distance from the top of the mountain down to the trial. Right, to, right where, where Barry Denon as pilot uh, says, and so the king is once again my guest. Mm -hmm. One of my, fit, definitely, you know, check it out now that you can see it on this big giant screen. Uh, it's amazing, and it's way ahead of its time, and, and yeah, you know, this film is definitely the first long-form music video, if you really yes. think about it. <laughs> well, it was the first ever rock opera that was made into a movie. It was the first rock opera that was successful, but it was made into a film. That's why it was difficult to get distribution, because none of the film studios had any idea what to do, really, with a rock opera. And uh, thanks to Norman Jewison, it was made. He, uh, 
as I said, wrote the screenplay, he produced it, he directed it, he also put up his money to make the film. And uh, so he believed in it because he heard the music, and like you folks, really appreciated that music and believed the film could be made, and so he did. So we all honor Norman Jewison constantly for having the courage to put this project together. Hey Ted, do you think this film, uh, a film like this, could be made today? Well, if you had a lot of money, yeah, and a lot of studios who would collaborate with you, but I, I don't know, unless Norman or someone like Norman would have the courage to direct it, I, I really doubt that. You know, you'll see again, every, everything that you see in this film was there, right? The only thing that was built for the movie was the King Herod moat that was, that was made there. But the scaffolding was there because they were they were reconstructing some stuff when you guys arrived. Yeah, one of the walls of uh, of uh, King Herod the Great's palace had caved in, and they were repairing it when we arrived to start shooting. And they were very kind. They told Mr. Jews and they'd take down the scaffolding and stuff. And he said, "No, I know exactly what to do with that scaffolding. Please leave it." Up. So, my point is, I just don't think a film could be made like that, a guerrilla style of filming, because no. you're not going to put an actor up on a scaffolding that's been sitting there. It, it's just the insurance alone would be you know, through the roof. So I think, I think the time of this film, 1972, 1973, were amazing movies were made at the time. I, I always find it as the golden age of film, modern film, uh, was the early 70s. And um, I think it's a one-of-a-kind, unique film, and I think that's why it stands with test of time. And that's why we have Frank sitting here, you see. <laughs> you can give me that funny rating. Um, I actually met Frank while we were preparing to do a show, live show, in Los Angeles. And uh, he, tell him how you happened to find out about the show. I was, I was filming something at the CBS Television City, and, and, and I was driving up there, I was going home, and I was driving up and I saw on, the, on Vine, it said, uh, Ted Neely, Yvonne Ellum, and Barry Denon, um, ben Vereen, One Night Only, Life. Oh, Jack Black was in that too. Yes, Uncle Jack. And, um, and I, I didn't know what the hell it was. I, I almost crashed. I pulled over, I walked in, and they're like, oh yeah, we're doing the show tomorrow, and all these people are coming, and Harrison Ford and Janet Jackson, and all these people are going to be there. And um, that was great. Uh, it was a fundraiser. Uh, Carl and I were asked in 1976 to go up to Santa Barbara. Uh, we were in LA go to Santa Barbara and uh, do a fundraiser for a junior high school teacher who was putting together a theater class for the children in school. And he asked us to, if we would come up and help him raise funds. So we said, sure. That was in 1976. And uh, we did it again when Frank saw it. It was the same organization many years later. And we were still raising funds for that same group and we did it in Hollywood. And I'm telling you, everybody who was anybody in the industry came to see that. And it was just remarkable, the who's who of people sitting in the audience. And uh, the school is still alive and well, and we're happy to be a part of it in Santa Barbara. And so last year, we were on this tour, this screening tour, and um, Ted got a, what was it, was it a, was it a DVD or something? He, somebody sent him something from the, from Holland? Was that where it came from? And we were looking at this stuff, and it turned out to be behind the scenes footage of these guys making the film in Israel in 1972. You've never seen it before, right? I didn't even know it existed. And it really was something, uh, because when we were there shooting the film, uh, because of the success of the previous album, which we referred to as the Brown Bible, because uh, <laughs> that's what we all learned it from. <laughs> Uh, and it was so successful around worldwide that there, when they knew we were making the film, there were uh, PR people coming from all over the world who were interviewing us, and primarily Norman Jewison. And there was a person that I actually was interviewed by when I was in, <coughs> excuse me, in Italy putting together a Superstar Live. Uh, a lady came from the Netherlands to interview me for her program, and she told me in the process that she was aware of a production that had been done, a documentary, uh, during the time we were shooting the film by a gentleman who was actually there interviewing all of us. And he did it for his country. And she said, I'll see if I can find a copy. And sure enough, she did and sent it to us. And, and I was just floored. Hey, I wanted to ask you, 
Don't mind us, we're just checking. Um, what, there's a scene of Ted in the desert with a bandana on riding a horse. Well, what were you, just, just horses just sitting around? You just went out for a horsey ride on a, on a day off? What was that? You, well, I, I, uh, you know, people have doggies and kitty cats, and could they take them with them to the movies or to the grocery store? Or, I took my horse with me. No, that's just like the bus. That's me making a joke. They, they liked the idea that there was a Texan in Israel. <laughs> and they wanted footage of me riding a horse. So that's who wanted footage of you? Uh, the local authorities, the people who were there letting us use their country. And uh, so we got to be on Israeli TV with that Texan riding a horse. <laughs> So we, we got this footage, right? We were all floored. We showed it to uh, Yvonne, and we showed it to Barry Denon. And um, so we decided, you know, another question everybody asks when we come to we do these screens is, hey, you know, we got the Blu-ray, we got the DVD. Why didn't Universal ever make a, a behind-the-scenes making of Jesus Christ Superstar? And I don't have the answer to that, and he doesn't have the answer to that. So the answer was, why don't we just make it ourselves? So uh, I got the pleasure of directing it, and he produced it. And it's called Superstars, and it came out uh, last Christmas. And it has the footage of, of the whole cast making the film, an interview of Norman Jewison talking about why he made this film, why is he sitting there in the ruins of Israel. And then we added as a bonus, we added uh, footage of the reunion that we did in New York with Norman Jewison and the whole cast. So this thing called Superstars, it's a DVD, it's available at the table. and. Um, Tell us about reuniting with everybody, seeing everybody for the first time again in 40-some years. Well, we've all been together uh, one at a time, two at a time, that sort of thing, but this was the first time that we had all gathered under the same roof at the same time since we made the film in the 70s. And it was just absolutely amazing. It was as if we were just on the set that day and we were on a break. And with Norman there as well. Uh, it was astounding. Norman being how old now? Like 91? He just turned 90, yeah, Norman Jewison. And uh, well, what did he do when he, we first saw you? He started, he did a little dance or something? Yeah, we, we were all uh, waiting and prepared for his arrival when we had this reunion in New York. And he didn't know that we had done all of this. He just, we wanted him to be there, and he wanted to be there, but he had no idea that uh, Frank and I had a camera crew waiting for his entrance, you see. And, and everybody's standing inside the, the lobby of this beautiful hotel. And uh, Norman knew we were there, but he didn't know we were all there waiting for him and his arrival. And when he walked in, everybody just went nuts, applauding, screaming, and hollering. And we managed to work him over to, so that he was in front of the, the still camera that we were going to shoot for this piece. And we all said, so Norman, what have you been doing? And he's 90. And he just went, Stay alive, stay alive, stay alive. He's great. He's unbelievable. He's and it, listen. You, it, in the in this DVD, you also we interview him like we're doing right now. We do, we have a Q and A, uh, and he, he he told us some told us some great stories about some of the visions and some of the ideas that he came up with to get this thing done. And it really this is a this is really a, a again a tribute to Norman as well because this is this is his vision that we're going to see tonight and uh, how, why it's kept going for so long. So uh, before, uh, Clinton, we have a couple of minutes, right? Anybody have any questions for Ted? Go ahead. I'm sorry, I wanted... How did you book the show? How did you get the gig? Oh, I see what you mean. I got the part? Yeah. Um, <laughs> with, a, with a false beard and mustache. That's true. I made such a deal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all by accident, honestly. Uh, uh, how much time do we have? I mean, it's hard for me to tell this story. The whole thing is, another shameless plug, the whole thing is on that Superstar DVD. It, Norman's point of view and Ted's point of view. Honestly, I was in Los Angeles with the band I was from Texas, and uh, we were doing very well in Los Angeles, and uh, most of the people who came to see us were people in the industry. Uh, actors, singers, dancers, musicians, the works, directors, uh, and uh, the clubs liked us a lot because we built that fan base. We were the only non-California band that was playing in California at the time. We were Texans and we were playing Southern rock and whatever. So we had a, a different kind of an audience. 
and uh, as you see, I do tend to talk a bit, and I would talk with the people after the on, after each set. And the club owners liked it because we had a fan base that followed us so much so that whenever it came time at quarter of two in the morning to close the club, everybody would leave except the people that we wanted to hang out with, and they just close the door and let us hang out until sunrise. So one of those nights, one of the actors said, "You know what, man? I, you guys work all the time." You have no idea how fortunate you are as a band. You get to work all the time. We actors seldom work. I have an audition tomorrow for a, for a, a Broadway show. I'd like you to come and see what I have to go through to get a job. So I wasn't working days. So I went to watch the audition. Now this guy, I didn't know, but he and several of his buddies who came to see us everywhere, I didn't know they made a plan prior to my going to watch this audition. They were going to get me on that stage. Come hell or high water, they were going to put me on the stage. I didn't know this. So you go to the audition and you have to line up and get numbers. For every one part that somebody gets, there's 400 people auditioning for that role. So you do the audition. So I'm watching. They call the number of my friend. He goes up and does his audition. And he comes out and we start to leave. They call my number. And I'm headed for the door. And he and his three buddies literally picked me up physically and put me on the stage. And silence in the room. It was dark. And there was a piano player. I introduced myself to the piano player. And I just stood there. And all of a sudden, this voice goes, in the darkness, are you Mr. Neely? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, what have you prepared for us today, Mr. Neely? And I said, nothing. <laughs> I've never done this before. I don't have any idea what to do. And he said, well, do you sing, Mr. Neely? And I said, yes. He said, well, since you're taking up our real estate, I'd like you to sing a rock tune that shows your vocal range and your ability to have rhythm and move. Well, I'm not a dancer. I uh, thank goodness Jesus doesn't dance. <laughs> So I sang, and I finished the song, and I start to walk off, and the voice in the darkness says, pardon me, Mr. Neely, uh, but uh, could you sing us a love song, something that preferably shows your sense of passion and your vocal range and your ability to convince someone that you have some spiritual feeling. So it worked out that one another reason why my band was successful was each one of us could do impersonations of other people. And <laughs> the song that I sang first, uh, was Stevie Wonder's version of For Once in My Life. And so he asked me to sing another song, and I'm thinking, good, Lord, what do I do now? Uh, so I thought, well, For Once in My Life, I was told was my Broadway show. So I was also doing impersonations of Tony Bennett, mm. so I did the same song as a ballad. And I said to the piano player, same song, just think Tony Bennett. So I sang the same song twice. Now, as it worked out, None of the actors with whom I went got hired, but they hired me. And the show was Hair. I got to play Claude Bukowski in Hair. For three and a half years, with the man who was the voice in the audience, the director, Tom Horgan, nurtured me like I was his son for three and a half years in Hair. Then we go to New York and he wants me to be a superstar on Broadway. I had the honor of being in Hair with Tommy Superstar and Sgt. Pepper, live on stage. And he directed three of those four. That's how I got the part, by accident. All right. Okay, we're gonna watch the film. Before I forget, I wanna do a shout out to Jeremy and Megan from the SIF podcast. They did a great podcast for this promoting this screening, and it's still online. And uh, you can where do you can where can you see it, Jeremy, Megan? Where can you see this go on Facebook? Sif.net, and we have a page for the podcast. Sif.net, and they talked to Ted for about an hour about all this cool stuff. So Jeremy, we, Megan, where are you? They were in the back, but I don't know where they are. They must. Sure. They, they went to get a sandwich or something. That's okay. They'll be back. <laughs> But we had a great time. We talked for over an hour about this, and uh, they're really sweethearts, and they do a podcast here locally, so that's the address, right? Sith.net. Yeah. So, uh, Seattle, thanks for coming out. Yes. Ted Neely, thanks for coming out. Yeah. We'll be around. We're not going anywhere. Enjoy the Super Star. See you afterwards, I hope.